I can save myself. At least that's the message that I am given in a million different ways from the world around me. That message of self-salvation, I can save myself. Now, if you've heard me preach before, you've heard me say some of these things, which is that we are given these relentless messages all around us about how if we just eat right, exercise enough, buy the right products, if we adopt any number of self-help hacks, then I will be okay. The message, in fact, is that I'll be a bit more than okay. I will escape. I will escape aging, wrinkles, disease, illness, mistakes. The implicit suggestion is, is that I can even escape my own mortality. I can escape death. I think it's really interesting how in the era of COVID-19, this message of self-salvation, I can save myself, gets ramped up in a really interesting way. Because like never before, we're, we have all these rules and regulations right in front of us all the time. All of the things that we have to do in order to keep ourselves and one another safe. Now, please hear me very clearly. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, there's really good things about this. I am fully 100% supportive of all of the measures that we can take to care for one another and to care for ourselves in such circumstances as this. I'm in favor of masks and hand washing and physical distance and guess what? I'm in favor of eating vegetables and getting exercise and looking after ourselves as well. It's just that when that is the only message that we receive that my actions and my choices can save myself, then we're living a lie. Because in fact, the thing is, is that I can't save myself. I can't save myself from my own humanity. Aging and wrinkles and disease and illness and death catch up with all of us. And when we think that it's all on our shoulders, it's all up to me, then when the world falls apart and things kind of go off the rails, then maybe what I'm left with is a sense of personal failure. Maybe what I feel is alone. And maybe I have no idea where to turn. For us as Christians, as people of faith, that message, I can save myself, is problematic in another very specific way, which is, I can save myself, is not the gospel. It is not the good news. Now, it's understandable why we get confused about this. I want to take today's gospel passage as a really good case in point. So today's gospel passage takes place in Jerusalem, in the temple, in the last few days before Jesus is crucified. And so we can see this conflict, this showdown between Jesus and the religious authorities really at a fever pitch. They are trying desperately to discredit him. They want to put him in a position where they can either convict him of heresy or they can get the crowds to turn on him. And so this passage begins a series of interactions of them trying to trick him. They say, by whose authority are you doing all of these things and saying all of these things? If Jesus says it's by God's authority, then he's a heretic. If he says that it is by his own authority, then people are going to think he's crazy. Jesus doesn't 
fall for this trick. Instead, he turns the tables on the religious authorities and he says, well, what about John the Baptist? Did his baptism come from God or not? He puts the religious leaders in exactly the same position they're trying to put him in because if they say that John the Baptist was from God, then they're standing in opposition to King Herod, who put him to death. But if they say that John the Baptist was just a looney tune doing his own thing out in the River Jordan, then the people are going to turn on them. And if things aren't at a fever pitch enough already, then Jesus turns up the heat a little more with this parable. He tells them a parable of a man who owns a vineyard and who has two sons, and he asks the two sons to go out and work in the vineyard. And one son says, "Ah, I don't think so, I've got better things to do. But then he changes his mind and he goes and does the work. The other son says, sure, I'll get right on that but never quite gets around to going out and doing the work. And so Jesus asks them this question, who does his father's will? And it's an easy answer. Of course, the one who does his father's will is the one who does the work. But what Jesus is doing here is he is pulling the rug out from underneath the religious authorities because he's very clearly pointing out that they think that their position in God's eyes is above reproach because they have the right titles and the right power and the right authority and all the right religious trappings around them. They say they believe the right things, but they're not doing the work. And what Jesus is saying to all of us is that, in fact, the Christian faith, the way of Jesus, is a practical faith. It needs to get lived out in action, in practice. Faith without works is dead, we learn elsewhere in scripture. If you say you believe and it doesn't translate into how you behave, then it's not faith at all. Now, if we're wondering what it actually looks like to do the work, to do God's will, well, then we should go back to the beginning of our Christian lives, which is baptism. We had the great privilege at the 8 o'clock service this morning of celebrating the baptism of a young man who has become part of our church community. And what we hear in the baptismal covenant is exactly where the rubber meets the road, where it is and how it is that we live out our Christian faith. What does it look like to do the work? Well, it looks like watching for the presence of Jesus in each and every single person that we meet, and then treating them accordingly with dignity, serving and loving them as if we are serving and loving Jesus himself. It looks like pursuing the ways of justice and peace for all people, and it looks like taking care of this beautiful earth and all of its rich resources. That's what it looks like to do the work. It's easy to see how we can then kind of get caught up in thinking that it's the work itself that's going to make us okay in the eyes of God. None of this is wrong. None of it is wrong to say that our faith is practical, that it has to be lived out, that we need to do the work. It's just that if we stop there, then we stop short of the gospel. What we have done is exactly what Tim Keller, a great uh, Christian speaker and writer, says we often run the risk of doing, which is to give people really good advice, but not give them good news. We become kind of one more version of that self-help, self-salvation message, but with religious trappings. 
I had a really interesting conversation with a parishioner not too long ago. We were talking about the reopening plan, getting back to in-person worship. And she said, you know, the thing is, is that I see all of the rules, I see all the regulations, I see all the protocols. That's great. But for us as people of faith, where is the language about trusting God? She wasn't talking specifically about St. George's. She was talking about the church in general. Where is the language in all of this about trusting God? Now, I think that her question was really on point. I think it's also a tricky question. And I think that if we take some care with the question, it takes us right into the heart of what this is all about. It takes us right into the heart of the gospel. Now the trick is, is that so often we misuse that language about trusting God. I might say that I trust God, but often if I'm being really honest, what I mean is that I trust God to do what I want, to give me the outcome that I desire. And then when that outcome doesn't materialize, then my faith gets really shaken. There's another distortion, and we, we can see it especially going on right now in our world, which is, I say I trust God, but what I really want is to be let off the hook of my own personal responsibility of how I care for myself and for others. If it's all up to God, if it's all in God's hands, then maybe I don't have to do my part. Those are distortions. Those are distortions of that language of trust. Because as we have already established, and we see it so clearly in today's gospel, actually, Jesus does empower us to make choices to make choices for goodness and mercy and compassion and helping and serving others. So what does it mean to trust God? What is the gospel? What is the good news? Well, very simply, it's love. It's as simple and as powerful as that. A relationship of love. That God is always always offering us. And so, yes, again, if we go back to baptism, the start of our Christian life, then yes, we do see what it means to do the work of faith. But also, for each and every question that we are asked in baptism about what we're going to promise in that baptismal covenant, the answer is, I will, with God's help, we don't do any of this alone. And any choice that we make to care for ourselves and for one another and for our world is done in complete and full partnership with God. We also say in baptism that whenever, not if, but whenever we fall into sin, whenever our lives get off track, whenever we mess up, We'll know that we can turn back. Repent, that's what that means, to turn back. Because God is there. Unconditionally, always, forever there. Reaching out to us in love and never losing sight of our true identity as God's beloved. We say that, in fact, baptism is a covenant which means it is an unbreakable promise. That's not because we don't turn away from God in all kinds of different ways. We know that we do. It's a covenant, an unbreakable promise, because God is unshakably faithful, unconditionally loving. God never abandons us and never leaves us. I don't save myself. You don't save yourself. Thank God. 
Thank God that the whole purpose of all of this is not to somehow save ourselves from our own humanity. To somehow escape all of what it means to be mortal and to be human. Thank God that it's God's relationship of love for which we are saved and by which we are saved. Thank God that each and every choice that we make to care for ourselves and to care for others is done in partnership with God. Thank God that when we feel fragile and small and weak, that we can draw on God's strength. Thank God that whenever all of the realities of our humanity and our mortality catch up with us, when mistake, mistakes and aging and disease and illness and death catch up with us, that we know that God is at work in the midst of it all, accompanying us, befriending us, drawing us close, holding us tight, naming and claiming us with love, working to bring light out of the darkness and new life out of death, and to always draw us back to our purpose, to our source, to our power, to our identity as God's beloved. Amen.